World War II. And most recently, he served as the chief scientist during the NOAA discovery of the Cutter McCulloch, lost off of Cape Conception. And we spoke a little bit about that via email last night. It was a veteran of the Battle of Manila Bay, 18, I think it was 1880, 1890 something, 97, 98. And Robert is currently the president of the Los Angeles Maritime Museum Research Society. And he's on the board of directors for our own Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. And so Robert, thank you very much for taking time in your day to talk to us. Oh, my pleasure, Elizabeth, and just want to say hello to your listeners, too, and look forward to uh, diving in and exploring some shipwrecks without getting wet. Okay, well, first, the diving in part. I would like for you to talk about the Peck Baroness, because that particular boat that was a bulk carrier was located at a depth of 1,500 feet off of Point Conception, and when I was um, in... Roatan, Honduras, uh, I took up diving and I couldn't get down. I mean, any, any way or shape getting down 1,500 feet. I mean, how did you find that boat? Well, Pack Baroness, uh, yes, that was went down in a collision with the Atlantic Wing, which was a car carrier in 1987 of uh, September. And it was foggy collision. Uh, pretty much came down to uh, bad communications between the two pilot houses of the ships. And of course, Pack Baroness uh, was severely wounded. <laughs> and, uh, she was carrying 21,000 metric tons of copper concentrate and went down in 1,500 feet of water. And it was recorded actually uh, by a group out of Santa Barbara with a remotely operated vehicle in 1987. And I returned uh, with uh, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries in partnership with the U.S. Navy in uh, 2002 to do further analysis of a, a potential threat from the uh, copper concentrate and the oh. carbons uh, from the fuel on board. So we used this remotely operated vehicle that was owned by the U.S. Navy. So uh, everything was done up through a tether to the ship. Uh, there were no people occupying the robot and we did a complete circumnavigation of the shipwreck. And actually, we're giving thought of returning to that site maybe this year to do some further analysis. We've been working with uh, Robert Ballard, Ocean Exploration Trust. Uh, they have a ship called the um, Nautilus. It's been working hmm. here in the Pacific for several years. And what's really beautiful about that, uh, you know, we, we're looking at a, a time with the pandemic where, you know, everything's virtual or <laughs> looking for opportunities where with satellite technology, when we bring uh, either um, OET's Exploration Trust Nautilus on site or our own ship uh, through uh, NOAA's um, Office of Exploration Research, uh, the, the Okeanos Explorer, we can, I can communicate with a team on this ship remotely like, like a conference call like we're having right now, but I can look on my own computer via satellite real time what the ROV is actually observing at the time. So I don't have to be on the ship. I can talk with the ROV pilot and say, go left, go right, hold station. And that can be anywhere in the world. And when the really great part for the public is with telepresence, you all get to watch us explore real time. How? Through satellite. So what we do is the ship oh. beams up the information via satellite, and there's an Internet connection where you can go to that website, URL, and you can actually, the public, can type in email requests for information like, what is that particular artifact, or what is that coral, or add information, you know, as a scientist or an observer. So, yeah, everything's real time now, and it's it's – I don't have to, you know, let's say if I'm doing a project in the Gulf of Mexico, I don't have to get on a plane, travel down there, the expense to the government, get on a ship and go out there and say, Bob, be ready at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, and we're going to explore that shipwreck, and it's all real time. But again, so the beauty you, is you, the public, get to watch us. Would you say yeah, that again? That the, so Okay, so if you're thinking, if you're so inclined and you're thinking, gosh, I've got some time, 
because I'm, you know, sheltering in place and I want to see a team of brilliant scientists discover a shipwreck. Tell us again how people can find out more yeah, about um, this. Yeah, o Ocean Exploration Trust is, uh, you can go to their website and they'll have, it's Nautilus Live is what it's called, and there'll be some upcoming expeditions here working off Channel Islands, uh, also further up the coast. I'm not sure if they're going to get up to Washington State, which is our Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, but they'll be working here in the Pacific uh, starting this fall, if not starting this month. I, the schedule is actually online. Again, if you just go to Nautilus Live, and it'll tell you, you know, when you, and these are broadcasted 24 hours a day. So if they're working in Channel Islands, they may be doing, you know, research on deep sea corals, uh, sea mounds um, throughout the sanctuary, but 24 hours a day. And because of COVID, we usually have educators and scientists on board representing Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. But in this case, they're going to be doing this telepresence where they communicate directly with the ship and the science team to direct them. So okay. science continues. Oh, that is just such good news. That's fantastic. Oh, it is fascinating. And, you know, we're, we're trying to do a lot more, you know, virtual. Um, just last weekend, we had Get Into Your Sanctuary, which is an annual event where we encourage people to get into their sanctuaries and take photographs, uh, enjoy them, recreate. And there's a photo contest. But we knew that this year was different, that limited people could actually go into their National Marine Sanctuary. So we did everything virtual. Um, we started on Friday, we went through Saturday and Sunday, and each of our sanctuaries did a presentation, a Q&A, um, on what's unique resources, that individual sanctuary, or national monuments, which we have two of them, and then you could ask Q&A live. So we went around, I mean, just to give you a big picture, you know, I'm, I'm based out of Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, which we're located on UC Santa Barbara campus, but the Office of National Marine Sanctuary serves as a trustee for a network of underwater parks encompassing more than 600,000 square miles of marine Great Lake waters from Washington State down to the Florida Keys, from Lake Huron and the Great Lakes all the way out to America Samoa. So this network includes 14 National Marine Sanctuaries and two national um, monuments. So it, it was just great because we just, I watched it all weekend long. I was involved with Channel Islands. I did a piece on uh, some of the shipwrecks that we have. Of course, you know, we have an amazing underwater maritime museum in the Santa, you know, in Santa Barbara's background with the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and National Park. And, and so I, I pretty much focused on a California Gold Rush steamer, uh, Winfield Scott, that was lost in 1853 at Anacapa Island with over 500 passengers and crew that were stranded on the island for eight days. And then we also featured Cuba, which was a, a passenger cargo ship, actually the same owner uh, as the Winfield Scott, but it was lost 70 years later in 1923 at San Miguel Island. And so those were featured, you know, in Get Into Your Sanctuary. And actually those exhibits are at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. And you think, okay, but the museum's closed to the public. But actually, as you mentioned, Greg Gorga, he's going around the museum and doing these virtual tours of the exhibits. And most recently, he just did the Winfield Scott. He did the Cuba. He did the, the, the destroyers that were lost actually the same day that the Cuba was lost in 1923 at Point Pinternalis, which is north of Point Conception. And, you know, it was nicknamed the Honda Naval Disaster, who of course was the U.S. Navy's worst peacetime disaster with respect to lots of ships. But, you know, as Greg is going around, most recently he did the first order for now lens that came from Point Conception. And no doubt that lens, uh, you know, guided many ships around the Cape Horn of the Pacific and saved many. And so... That's a good Greg connection. Is, you know, yeah. Oh, he's great. It's just all these, you know, every week he's got one or two new virtual... Uh, presentations, like you say, including shipwreck exhibits. So I really encourage people to go there. And as you mentioned, the uh, the Conestoga in your opening, that was the top five unsolved shipwreck mysteries that I was involved in. And I just did a first Zoom virtual a presentation at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum, the first 
dedicated presentation to, to this story. And not only did we do it live, it's archived. So if you go to the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum's website and you go to education and past presentations, there's one that I've done on Conestoga. Uh, most recently, the um, last discovery, as you mentioned, was the McCulloch, which was a former revenue cutter, later Coast Guard cutter, served at the Battle of Manila Bay. And I also did one on the shipwreck Montebello that was torpedoed by a Japanese submarine off Cambria, California, and sits 900 feet of water. And that particular shipwreck, I went down in a submersible. So I got to see it up close and personal. But you know, talking about Mac uh, Point Conception, the, the Macaulay, that, that was an interesting one. Um, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary in partnership with the U.S. Coast Guard, we worked off the uh, research vessel Shearwater, which is uh, run and operated by the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And we went out there in 2016 to survey the possible um, remains of the Macaulay. And just to give you a little background on the ship, she was built in Philadelphia and went down on a, a shakedown cruise 23,000 miles around the world. Not the short trip around Cape Horn, which is 13,000 miles. The U.S. Revenue Service wanted to show off this ship. It was the largest revenue cutter built in the United States in 1897. They completed it. So she did left uh, Philadelphia for her new duty station, which was San Francisco, and headed through uh, the Suez Canal, being the first revenue cutter ever to go through the Suez Canal, and then through the Indian Ocean as well, and arrived in Singapore on the eve of uh, the Spanish-American War. And, and Commodore Dewey was in charge of the fleet there, preparing to, you know, have a battle there at Manila Bay and saw this brand new 219 foot Coast Guard cutter and said, you're part of my fleet. Paint, you know, and they painted the ship gray. And unfortunately, as they were sneaking into the battle, um, McCulloch had a, a fire in its smokestack. And it basically blew up this flame in the air and they started receiving shots from El Freire, which is a battery, an island, and so probably the first shots in the Spanish-American War were shot at the McCulloch. They returned fire, silenced the guns, and of course, as we know, the decisive battle was won with no loss of lives as far as in the battle, but McCulloch was the only ship to lose an American, and, and that was actually the um, chief uh, mate that was fighting the fire. And... Um, and that, may I, may and I we, ask, I think so, we, so the, the journey that was 23,000 miles around the world, what, what year did that happen? 1898. 1898. The battle was in May of 1898. Okay. And, of course, we, 10 Spanish ships were lost. Uh, there was 381 Spaniards that, that were lost in the battle. But after that, McCulloch got a special assignment because the – telegram system at, you know, Manila Bay had been taken out, so they couldn't, you know, radio that the invasion was about to happen. So McCulloch became the dispatch ship for Commodore Dewey, and it traveled 640 miles from the Philippines to Hong Kong to deliver the message to the U.S. government and the world that the first battle in the Spanish-American War had been won. And McCulloch returned to Manila with um, new orders uh, that Commodore Dewey had been promoted to Admiral. Wow. And so let's go to Eventually, uh, McCulloch went to uh, Hawaiian Islands and arrived in San Francisco in 1899 of January. And then moving forward off Point Conception in 1917, McCulloch and just one other duty that she had, she, she basically, before I go to her loss, she um, served in the winter months um, patrolling between uh, Cape Blanco, Oregon, and the Mexican border. And pretty much the same duties that the Coast Guard would do today in customs enforcement. Um, and she was doing this also in um, the Arctic. She was part of, a, she was basically a floating courtroom um, enforcing uh, fur seal regulations up there. 
And amazing. So we have to go to quick break, yeah, Robert. Yeah, she worked off the Pribilof Islands. Okay, fantastic. I want to hear more. We got to go to quick break. Richard's giving me hand signals. Um, and when we get back, I want to talk about um, the, the, the Winfield Scott a little bit more, because that, yes. that just amazed me looking into that. And I also want to talk a little bit about if you would explain to us the Sunken Military Craft Act. Um, that was something that I uncovered in my research that um, I'd really like to hear what that act entails. So let's ho hold on to those thoughts, Robert, and let's go to quick break. I'm speaking with Robert Schwemmer, currently the West Coast Regional Maritime Heritage Coordinator for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. It's a great honor to have him on the program. Hang on, my dear listener. We'll be back with Robert in two seconds. And you're clear, Elizabeth. Okay. Hey, Robert. Is Robert still there? Go ahead. Hear me? Oh, there we go. There's Robert. Oh. Okay. You're doing so great. This is fantastic. I sure appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. So, yeah, I'd like to definitely talk about the Sunken Military Craft Act and a little bit more about the Winfield Scott. Um, and okay. I'd like to, like to hear you talk about how do you collide with an island? I mean, you know, what in, in the, in the research, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Um, and then, you know, the, the, a little bit of the, um, SS Cuba and, and the, okay. the San, and the San Miguel and, um, the, and also maybe we could talk a little bit about what those survivors were doing for those eight days on the island waiting to, for salvation. I mean, that's kind of a cool story too. Okay. All right. And then we have to go, Richard, are you there? I am here. So how many more breaks do we need? Let me look real quick. Yeah. One more break after this. When this okay. is done, you'll need one more. Okay. So then, um, Robert, how about we talk a little bit about the Sunken Military Craft Act, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll finish up with the rest of the, the questions um, I'm, I'm okay. asking. Okay. All right. We're rolling right along here. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart, and I have the honor of talking with Robert Schwemmer, the West Coast Regional Maritime Heritage Coordinator for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Before we went to break, I asked him if he could explain the Sunken Military Craft Act. Certainly. Um, actually, it's an act that was, I believe it was in 2004. It's basically its primary purpose is to preserve and protect from unauthorized disturbance any sunken military craft and it does that the US government owns and this could be vessels in foreign countries uh, that we still own and have rights to and where I think it has come into play at least in the work that I've done especially with McCulloch uh, we were just talking about that was lost off point conception in a collision with the US with the uh, SS governor in 1917 uh, the McCulloch itself is not in a National Marine Sanctuary. It's actually in the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. So there's no federal protection as 
a national marine sanctuary asset, but by itself, since it's still a U.S. government-owned vessel, U.S. Coast Guard, it provides protection that nobody can disturb that site. And I think the one that really is important um, that stands out is the USS Conestoga, as I mentioned a little earlier. It was a vessel, it was a fleet tug that went missing without a trace. It was the top five unsolved mysteries. 1921, March 25th, left San Francisco, disappeared without a trace. And it was believed lost off Hawaii. It launched the largest sea and air search in 1921 up until 1937 when they started looking for Amelia Earhart. Ultimately, we found a ship. It was um, surveyed in 2014 off Greater Farallon's National Marine Sanctuary off Southeast Farallon Island, and it turned out to be the remains, um, the, the burial site the military gravesite. It is in a National Marine Sanctuary, so it does have that protection, fortunately. But with the Military Craft Act, it has even more protection. So if somebody wants to go to the site and do survey work even, it has to be cleared by the U.S. Navy. So this applies to this military gravesite. It also applies to, you know, um, our ship, McCauley, Off Point Conception. And would you talk a little bit about the disaster where those people were marooned on the islands um, for eight days? Oh, the Winfield Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was um, – I love the Winfield Scott story in the sense of over 500 passengers and, and crew being – living on what they described as the rock. This The ship was en route from um, San Francisco to Panama in 1853, and it uh, – Captain Samuel Blunt. He was had some pretty good knowledge about Santa Barbara Channel because he worked with the Coast Survey. And to get bragging rights to be the first steamer to Panama or vice versa, he would not go around the Channel Islands. He decided, I'm going to cut through the Channel. He was actually trying to pass between Santa Cruz and Anacapa Island. It started getting foggy and and actually one of the survivors kind of stepped over the threshold into the pilot house and they said you know it's kind of getting a little sloppy out there shouldn't you slow down and captain blunt said no let her rip so at 11 knots he ran into this fog bank right into middle anacapa island and and if you get a chance you know eventually go to the santa barbara maritime museum because we got survivors accounts that really get into the details of what life is like on the island uh, i remember it was a survivor i think it was edward bolsky he was a passenger he says at midnight it was suddenly awakened from a sound sleep by a terrible our crashing of timbers tumbling out of my berth i was confronted by this horror-stricken vestige of my toothless and bald-headed stateroom companion who had no time to secure his wig and false teeth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then uh, another account, there was a 19th century fisherman, as we know as Captain George Nightever, um, famous bear hunter, trapper, who actually came to the island and provided fishing hooks so they could fish from shore or, you know, from the salvaged lifeboats. But, you know, Winfield Scott was one of the few shipwrecks from the California Gold Rush that was actually wrecked on its way to Panama, so it gives archaeologists a better understanding of actually what people are taken away from California. So today the site is actually listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and that's part of what uh, the Office of National Marine Sanctuary does under the National Preservation Act, is that we have to inventory all these shipwrecks. And if they meet criteria for the National Register of Historic Places or Landmark, it's our job to actually do that process, which is I'm currently doing for the McCulloch, and um, I've done some, I did one for Conestoga, which is now listed, but yeah, the, 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 the first person accounts of living on the island, there was plunder going on in the carpet bags, uh, basically the ship wrecks, they go onto this very small rock the first night until they could find a suitable landing place, which is now known as Frenchy's Cove, which is still pretty small. And the next day, the steamer California came in and, you know, had a full uh, complement of people headed to San Francisco. So it could only take women and children and, of course, $800,000 worth of gold bullion. Oh, my God. <laughs> the island, which I thought, yeah, they took the gold. In the, and so 
the plan was that the California would return to, um, you know, pick them up, and it took eight days, and they were getting pretty low on supplies at that point. They had taken a cannon from the Winfield Scott, put it on the island as a signal gun, and on the eighth day, they heard cannon fire from the California. They fired their cannon, and and people started, you know, <laughs> coming alive with excitement, and the hungry ones, as the first boat came in with the captain from the California, do you have food? And he's like, I got enough food yeah and oxen on board and he just went on and i said it's like you're going to be fed and picked everybody up and continued their trip to panama they didn't go back to san francisco they continued and so a lot of the bags were being plundered um carpet bags uh, ace of cyrus call talks about his pistol being stolen so they went through and they actually found the thieves and they were whipped in front of everybody and the captain you know pretty much stopped any more theft on the island. Uh, we got to go to quick break. When we get back, we're going to talk a little bit about my, the top of mind question to Robert Schwimmer, the West Coast Regional Maritime Heritage Coordinator for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. I want to know if there's any ghosts that you've ever seen around these, these wrecks when we get back from the break. Don't turn that down. Back in a minute. <laughs> So Richard, how many minutes? They'll have three and a half minutes. Okay. And Robert? Yes. Can you talk about um, sort of the, the um, ghosts and spirits that you might have seen for three and a half minutes? <laughs> ghosts and spirits. <laughs> That's right. Ghosts and spirits are some kind of uh, interesting feeling that you have when you look at a, at a sunken ship. Uh, but we don't have much time. We've only got three, three and a half minutes when we get back. But um, if you, yeah, talk about how you feel when you see uh, people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can talk about that. But yeah, no ghosts and spirits. But no yeah, ghosts and certainly. spirits. Okay. Yeah. Dogs. Yeah, that's my dog. He's <laughs> a a attacking something out there. He's a, he's a mini miniature dash and he doesn't really. Yeah. Not really an attack dog. What are you doing? That's funny because uh, your dog thinks he's bigger than he is, and my dog, who is big, thinks he's smaller than he is. That's usually the case. Speed bunny boat like a bird on the wing, on board the sailors cry. Carry the lad that's born to be king. In three, two, on the sea one, you're live. Welcome back. I'm talking with Robert Schwimmer, the West Coast Regional Maritime Heritage Coordinator for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And we're talking a little bit about the, the glories of the ocean as we are kind of landlocked and, and sheltering in place. There's a lot of stuff happening in the ocean. And um, Robert was kind enough to tell us about the Ocean Exploration Trust. And if you're interested to see the explorations online, go to Nautilus Live. And you can watch 24 seven as teams are excavating um, virtually uh, the, the sunken treasures off our coast. And I asked Robert to talk a little bit about the spirits that he might feel 
And he said he can't talk about the ghost, but he can talk about how he feels when he discovers a sunken ship. And how do you feel when you do that, Robert? Yeah, yeah, it's a, a great question. Uh, you know, I've had countless stories of people contacting me um, after you know we have made shipwreck discoveries. One of their family members may have been on board, in some cases lost. And it brings new meaning to these important human stories. And one is, of course, USS Conestoga in my life, because when I was trying to figure out what this mystery tug was off southeast Farallon Island, I started doing research on a potential um, candidate. And there was a professional photographer on this U.S. Navy tug in San Diego in 1921 that photographed the crew, professional photographer. And when I was putting this together that this might be our lost ship, I looked into their faces, and they were written off as lost without a trace, somewhere in the deep Pacific off Hawaii. And I'm like, I go, my God, could this be their ship? And can we bring closure to the family members? Long story short, 95th anniversary of the loss of the USS Conestoga. I was in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. Navy Memorial with James Delgado, my colleague, and Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and we gave a presentation to five generations of family members of those deceased sailors. Oh, beautiful. Robert, thank you so much for coming along today. Uh, and again, Ocean Exploration Trust, Nautilus Live, if you want to see up close and personal what Robert is working on. And Robert, thank you very, very much for giving us you know, you. A, a look outside of our homes as we so, so desperately need. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. You're clear. You are clear. Robert, thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you so much. I'll send you this link. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.